Let's pray together. Father, we uh, pray fervently uh, for uh, for Marcia Smith tonight. And uh, Father, uh, we we thank you for her and Jerry and their faith. And Father, no matter what they face, uh, they always uh, just just take it so well. They just they just keep looking to you. They, they trust in you, Father, that no matter what happens in life, it's going to be okay, life or death. And, uh, and Father, we just, we thank you for that. We thank you for examples we have of, of people who handle adversity well. Um, and just, uh, we thank you for them. Father, we do pray that Marsha can pull through uh, uh, this incident as well. And, um, uh, quite, uh, we, I mean, obviously it'll be amazing if she does, uh, but Father, we do pray for that. And uh, just like before, uh, how she got through just all the things that were wrong when she was in the hospital the last time, including COVID. And uh, Father, just be with her and bless her. And, and God, um, if it is her time to transition to the next life, we pray that it'll be as smooth as possible. We pray that she won't have to feel any pain or anything. Um, uh, but God, our prayer, our, our, our number one request is for her to bounce back once again and, um, and have some more years. And uh, we, we sure pray that for Jerry as well. Uh, be with him and comfort him and, and uh, bless him. Father, we're, um, uh, we're saddened also with the uh, passing of Carl Martin. Um, God, be with Rhonda especially. Uh, bless her and Rick and, and be with Justin and Megan Reynolds um, as well and Eddie and Drew. And Father and, and the other uh, family uh, that that uh, that he has, uh, just bless all of them as they go through this time of grief and uh, provide comfort uh, for them and peace. Um, God, we also continue our prayers for uh, Madeline Galarza, and uh, Father, pray that uh, that she can get back to 100% as soon as possible. Be with be with Nestor as he ministers to her. And Father, uh, be with uh, uh, Jim Hope and uh, be with him as he um, uh, continues along his path. We pray for good pain management uh, for him um, and just um, uh, glad, um, uh, glad he's able to be in class uh, tonight and other times. And uh, so, Father, thank you for that. Thanks for the fellowship we can have over these hundreds of miles. God, we, um, we just pray that you'll bless us as we uh, delve into your word tonight. Um, help us to really um, uh, despite the, uh, the negative things uh, today with Marsha and Carl, uh, we do uh, uh, pray that we'll be uplifted by your word, that we'll be motivated by it, and that we will, that our lives will be um, in, con that we'll, they will be parallel to uh, the, and, and right along with what you want us uh, to be, Father. Uh, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, he'll finish out the book. We have uh, Genesis 50, the first half uh, next week, and then on February 28th, uh, the second half of Genesis 50. So uh, looking forward to, uh, I'm sure that'll be great. And uh, uh, he, David is a great uh, uh, Old Testament uh, scholar, uh, so to speak. So uh, really um, glad that he's able to sub uh, for me for the two weeks. So, all righty. So uh, for the introduction, I, I'm going to start with a quote tonight from one of the people quoted in the booklet, um, uh, Hamilton, Victor Hamilton. Now convinced that Joseph is alive, Jacob resolves to go down to Egypt immediately. He suggests the possibility that his time is growing shorter, and that's in verse 28. If he waits too long, advancing age or death will prohibit uh, such a voyage. And so I thought that was just a good summary statement as we um, move into tonight's lesson. I'm going to repeat uh, from last week, Genesis 46 uh, one through four, just because the, the introduction to this lesson did talk about, once again, the, um, uh, the, the blessing that it was that Jacob was able to have another vision from the father and uh, another interaction that gave him confidence in what he was doing. Uh, so Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, here I am. And then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. And as I mentioned last week at the close, 
I think that's a super touching uh, part of the text here, part of what God wanted us to see, um, that he gave Israel um, the confidence to know um, that Joseph would be there at his death. And I, I think that's really uh, comforting. We, we all want people we love to be around us, if possible, when we, when we pass away. Um, and then again, I wanted to show you the map just because this one does show Beersheba. So they were in Hebron. All the brothers came back to get, uh, to bring Israel, to bring Jacob uh, to, uh, to Egypt. They stopped in Beersheba. They offered sacrifices. And that's where he saw the visions uh, that we just read about. And then they continue on to the land of, uh, of Goshen uh, there in Egypt. And here's the, um, uh, the last part of chapter 46. He had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to show the way before him in Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. Then Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, in Goshen. He presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. So we had last week uh, Joseph revealing himself to his brothers um, and just the, the weeping that took place, the hugging that took place. And then here uh, we have the little added phrase, a good while. And so... Of course, Jacob has thought that his favorite son, uh, his son by Rachel, um, you know, was gone. I mean, he's, he's been thinking for all these years uh, that he's dead. And of course, now this reunion and uh, just a fabulous scene. Uh, verse 30, Israel said to Joseph, now let me die since I have seen your face and know that you are still alive. Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers in my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of livestock and have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. When Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth, even until now, both we and our fathers. In order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Uh, we had earlier... Uh, that for the Egyptians to eat with a Semite or, um, was an abomination as well. That's why Joseph ate by himself. The Egyptians that were part of that meal ate by themselves, and Joseph's brothers all ate by themselves. They wouldn't even eat with Joseph, um, even though he had risen to number two in Egypt. Uh, the Egyptians just uh, felt that was, um, you know, inappropriate at the very least. And it sounds like, you know, thought it was uh, downright uh, dirty or nasty. Uh, to do. So, um, so we jump into chapter 47, um, our text uh, for tonight. Um, and the first thing we're going to see is the brothers with Pharaoh, and then Jacob with Pharaoh, and then, um, and then the uh, third section will wrap things up. But uh, so this is just verses one through six, uh, the brothers with Pharaoh. Uh, so Joseph went in and told Pharaoh, he does exactly what he says he's going to do. Um, my father and my brothers, with their flocks and their herds and all that they possess, have come from the land of Canaan. They are now in the land of Goshen. And from among his brothers, he took five men and presented them to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, as our fathers were. And, uh, and this was a neat insight, and this was included in the booklet. Uh, but Alan Ross said, uh, their straightforward answer was intended to achieve what Joseph's advice wanted to achieve, a separate life in the land of Goshen. And so um, uh, Joseph just knew the straightforward, honest answer uh, would be the way to get them to have their own section, kind of away uh, from the Egyptians. And so that, like they said, that's exactly what took place. Um, you might recall last week, if you were able to be here, uh, the land of Goshen was about the size of Franklin County and Delaware County put together, and um, and uh, there are about 1.5 million in those two counties, and of course the the, the people of Israel got to about that point probably uh, 600,000 men by the time they left, and so quite a quite a crowd and uh, and but anyway that that area was it turned out to be great, and God blessed His people. Um, uh, in that land, he said, you're, you know, you're going to be fruitful, you're going to multiply, and they, they sure did. They, they had a good uh, uh, 400 years uh, there in, in Egypt. Uh, good, I mean, uh, besides the fact that they ended up being slaves, but you know what I mean, good as far as uh, uh, making the nation big and great uh, in that way. 
Um, and then verse four, we, they said to Pharaoh, we've come to sojourn in the land for there's no pasture for your servants flocks for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. And now please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen. And if you know any able men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. And so Pharaoh basically is making sure they're going to stay employed. Now they're going to have work to do. And, you know, Pharaoh obviously already is saying, basically the land of Egypt is yours to do with as you please, Joseph. Obviously your family, uh, you can take care of them here. But then also, hey, give them, give them a job. <laughs> so I think Pharaoh was being, I mean, just, he wanted to be. I mean, Joseph had been the best thing that ever happened to Pharaoh. It would have been a disaster if Pharaoh wouldn't have had Joseph and wouldn't have known about the famine, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and so, you know, Pharaoh has no problem. Uh, just as Potiphar had no problem making Joseph in charge of the whole house, the jailer had no problem making Joseph in charge of the whole jail, the uh, the Pharaoh at that time had no problem with Joseph uh, being in charge. Uh, Salehammer says, thus the narrative shows that Joseph's fortune was duplicated in the fortune of his brothers. The land of Goshen is called the best part of the land, which perhaps is a wordplay on the good that God intended in all these recorded events. And you'll see that in two weeks in chapter 50, uh, verse 20. So I will pause here before the next section, uh, see if there are any comments that any of you want to make anything all this reminds you of yeah go ahead george uh, just it's this section more than any other that just makes me think that somehow some way pharaoh was a hyksos and not an egyptian oh yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah shepherds I, I i can't prove it but man it just seems that way <laughs> yes i mean as we discussed but you're right this is this is quite um this this seems like it would be different, um, you know, than if a, an Egyptian had been in charge, like a pure, or I don't know how to word that. Uh, but yes, it does. It does make that seem clear. The only part that might be contrary to what you're saying would be the fact that they wouldn't eat with them. I don't know if the Hyksos would have not wanted to eat with and wouldn't have wanted to be associated to the same extent that the Egyptian. So, I mean, that's just a counterpoint. I'm not arguing one way or the other. I don't have a, I don't have a, I don't really have an opinion at all. I was going to say, I don't have a strong opinion. I don't really have an opinion on it. Uh, but, uh, but it does make, I mean, everything you've said that the, this week and then a couple of weeks ago, yeah, it just, it makes sense. And, and, um, and you're not the only one, like we looked at those uh, different things. There, there are people who uh, uh, follow suit with that. So anyway, thank you though, uh, for bringing that up, but you're right. This is, this is, this is quite, this is aggressively, supportive and and um, cooperative so yeah really really neat so okay verses 7 through 12 then joseph brought in jacob his father and stood him before pharaoh and jacob blessed pharaoh um and and then i put in one of the quotes from the book i thought it was good but that that's quite a for Jacob to come in and bless the pharaoh is contrary to what you would think would happen there you would think um, well, maybe the text is wrong, but it's it's that's the way it is. It's it's Jacob blessing Pharaoh, and and uh, Kuravilla and others feel it's it's mainly because of age. There was just a high respect for age in the ancient Near East and into Egypt throughout this whole region, and especially at that time, uh, just just a huge huge deal. And uh, so, in the audience between Jacob's sons and Pharaoh. The former are recipients, Jacob's sons are the recipients of Pharaoh's favor, of his blessing. But in the audience between Jacob and Pharaoh, Pharaoh is at the receiving end. And, um, and then, of course, we're going to see in the text, Pharaoh asks Jacob how old he is. Um, and, uh, you know, so that is, that is a contributing uh, factor here. Yeah, Susan or Chris, go ahead. But maybe he's Chris, taking the... <clears throat> Maybe he's taking an account that all the blessings he got from his son and is showing respect to take care of his family as well, since they're taking care of both the Egyptians and Pharaoh themselves. So, yeah, that's kind of where my mind went with it. So, yeah, there's no doubt about what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. 
So anyway, but but pretty cool, pretty pretty neat right here. And thank you, Chris, for uh, for pointing that out. Um, so then Pharaoh said to Jacob, "How many are the days of the years of your life?" <laughs> and Jacob said to Pharaoh, "The days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers." in the days of their sojourn. Um, you know, uh, Abraham and Isaac uh, lived longer. Uh, I can't remember. It seems like Isaac lived to 170. I can't remember. This is in the diminishing years of people's age. You know, it's, it's getting more and more like our years. And by the time of the New Testament, well, even before that, in the, once we get out of this time period, the, the years are, are pretty much as we expect them to be even today. Um, but um, Hey, I, I, I wish he, but his days, he, he knew he would go in sorrow down to Sheol. You know, once Joseph was dead, Jacob kind of just lost his will to live, so to speak. I mean, obviously he lived a long time still, but um, he calls his days few and evil. And uh, so now evil in the Hebrew uh, does not necessarily mean evil as, a, as, as we would think of it. It doesn't necessarily mean immoral. It could just mean uh, evil is also used to just mean uh, bad in general. So just a, a, a general uh, life of lament, uh, maybe, uh, could be what he meant. But, uh, but few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And he just points out he hasn't lived as long as, as his father's. Um, the word sojourning, um, the idea that he considered his life a journey uh, was just a fabulous attitude. And I think Abraham, Abraham literally uh, wondered. Uh, he, he literally was on a journey the whole time, just about. Um, and, uh, but he realized his life was that. And, uh, and Hebrews 11 brings this out, talking about the people of faith. Um, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. And having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, and so this, you know, this is talking about all the people of faith from the Old Testament. You know, as you go through the list of them, and so this, these aren't people who we would expect that from. People that know Christ, people that know more about eternity. You know, though, you know, us and anyone from Christ on. These were people before that. They realized it, and I think that's a great uh, thing for us to realize. They, they also realized that there was something else coming, that this wasn't their real home. Uh, verse 14, for people who speak thus make it clear that they're seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. So just really, really awesome. I love that pass. I, I quote Hebrews 11, 13 to 16 a lot. And um, it was nice that in the booklet it was referenced. And so I wanted to uh, share that with you here. But he, you know, Pharaoh asks Jacob, how many years of your life, you know, have you lived? You know, and he uses, you know, life and lived. And then Jacob turns it around. Both times he says, he says, sojourning concerning his life, and then also concerning the lives of his fathers who lived, you know, longer than he did. Both times, uh, he calls it a, a journey, an expedition. Um, he he talks about sojourning, uh, traveling through this life. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. Then Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, the best in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with food, according to the number of their dependents. So um, Joseph, of course, he's in charge of all the grain. He's in charge of all the food of the land. As we're going to see um, just a little bit, I'm going to read you the section that wasn't technically part of our lesson for tonight. Um, and But he, he takes care of his family, uh, number one. So pretty, pretty awesome, pretty neat. Um, okay, the, the part between... Um, it just kind of gives a, a general statement about how Joseph handled everything. Um, he sure handled this as, as shrewd as a snake. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, be as shrewd as vipers or whatever the word he uses there, um, or shrewd as serpents, maybe. 
um, uh, but as peaceful as doves. But uh, Joseph definitely, he's the businessman uh, during this time. He already has been. He's uh, handled this all uh, for Pharaoh's benefit. And he doesn't stop uh, with just uh, taking payment for this grain. Um, he, um, he starts taking, taking the land. Uh, Pharaoh ends up with everything except the priest's land. And uh, this is all you know, Joseph's doing, and the people are willing to do it because they know they'll die if they don't do it. So uh, he's definitely, um, he, I would just call him the businessman through this. He does everything. Uh, he is loyal to the one who put him in this position. He is loyal to the Pharaoh, that's for sure. So uh, 13 to 26, and then I'll pause again if, if any of you want to uh, mention anything. Uh, now, there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain that they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? For our money is gone. And Joseph answered, give your livestock and I will give you food in exchange for your livestock if your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the herds, and the donkeys. He supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. And when that year was ended, they came to him the following year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. The herds of livestock are my Lord's. There's nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for all the Egyptians sold their fields, because the famine was severe on them. The land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he made servants of them from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy. For the priests had a fixed allowance from Pharaoh and lived on the allowance that Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have this day bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And at the harvest, you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four fifths shall be your own. As seed for the field, and as food for yourselves and your households, and as food for your little ones. And they said, You have saved our lives. May it please my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. So Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt, and it stands to this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth. The land of the priests alone did not become Pharaoh's. So uh, anyway, uh, talk about, a—I mean, uh, not exactly a scam because they would have died <laughs> otherwise, but uh, definitely, um, definitely Joseph knew what he was doing as far as business goes, and he... Um, he, uh, uh, you know, they ended up having everything, uh, Pharaoh. And uh, so anyway, that, that's just interesting to me, that whole section, uh, not technically part of the booklet, but uh, does anyone have any comments they want to make at this point before we look at um, uh, verses 27 uh, to the end of this chapter? All righty. So let's uh, go. This is Joseph's vow to Jacob. So now uh, Jacob wants to make sure uh, that he gets buried back home and not in Egypt. And Joseph uh, vows to make this uh, happen. So uh, verses 27 to 31, I should have said. All right. Thus Israel, Jacob, thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen. And they gained possessions in it and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. So here they are moving uh, into um, uh, the great nation uh, that they became there in Egypt um, and, and beginning right away. I mean, this is still, while Joseph is alive, this is being said. Of course, it's being written later by Moses, uh, I believe. And so uh, he could be uh, foreshadowing a little bit here, but, um, but here they go. Uh, Longman says that they were fruitful and increased greatly in number is reminiscent of both God's command to Adam and Eve as well as the promise to Abraham that his descendants would become a great nation. Uh, this promise was given to Abraham, then Isaac, and then Jacob. Furthermore, it looks forward to the opening of the book of Exodus, which will repeat this phrase. So as you can see, Exodus 1-7, uh, the same idea uh, is put forth. So pretty, pretty cool. So um, 
Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So he, you know, he, once he saw Joseph again, he was, you know, I think it was just a, a statement. Now I'm ready to die. Um, but, but he lived 17 more years. So as you can see, he lived to 147. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life were 147. And when the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son, Joseph, and said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, Put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. Um, and uh, some translations say on his staff, but he um, an acceptance here, uh, but either way, this idea that, okay, this vow has been made, everything's good. To um, uh, one, um, um, it might have been in the booklet, uh, one of the quotes, but um, to, well, maybe I included it. I kept debating whether or not to. No, I didn't. Um, the, the idea that um, men, when they would make covenants or make vows, uh, they would place, uh, as it says here, put your hand under my thigh. And so this you know, obviously extremely awkward for us. Uh, we would not do this. People shake on it today. They shake their hands. Um, but this was a, a sign. And, and one of the quotes was to put the hand that close to the organ of procreation um, showed a sign of trust and a and that this would be done, um, that, that this would, you know, uh, may my offspring even be accursed if I do not make this happen is one of the ideas uh, that people think might have been part of this idea of uh, putting the hand under the thigh um, concerning covenants, promises, and vows like this one. Um, but Joseph, of course, he has no intention of not doing this, and he does do it. And uh, so, um, in fact, next week's lesson is Joseph mourning over Jacob's death. And uh, so, uh, so that, that'll be uh, ch chapter 50, verses 1 to 14. Um, so any, any comments here um, before we look at the applications? So, yeah, David, go ahead, David Moore. I was just thinking about what Joseph um, tells his brothers more toward the end of Genesis, but he says mm -hmm. what you meant for evil, God did for good. Mm -hmm. And maybe God would have had another plan of preserving Israel, but uh God used what he had, and and that's what God does. I mean, Joseph's yes. brothers meant evil when they sold him into Egypt, but uh, God sure made the best of it, and he worked out the plan anyway. So, yes, yeah, even you're, when we mistake yeah. make mistakes along the way mm -hmm. in our lives, it's just good to know that God can uh, use that mistake and still do the ultimate good that he desires from us yeah yeah that, that's fabulous and i've got an, an, an additional uh application of those thoughts that you just had david uh based on i had a conversation with someone today who uh, who was just just had so much regret uh for things uh in the past and um and you know but this is what god can do with those things he can take like you said um, as Joseph said to his brothers, um, you know, you meant this for evil, but God, and we're promised this in Romans 8, God can bring good out of all things for those who love the Lord, and God does. And I think, I think Romans 8, uh, uh, 28 is, is a sign of, uh, it's 18 or 28, sorry if I got that wrong. I think it's Romans 8, 28. Um, yeah, the, yeah. The, um, the fact that God can do that, I think, shows his power shows his mercy, shows his love. I think um, that left to things being natural, uh, evil would only lead to more evil. Uh, but because God is involved, uh, we can make those mistakes, like you said. And, and Joseph's brothers can make this huge mistake of selling their brother into slavery. And, um, and God can take those things and, and turn them on their heads and, um, and, and change according to his plan. I agree with you also that if he would have found some way uh, to bring the Christ into this world, obviously, but this is what God wanted. He wanted it to be through the line of Judah. He wanted it to be this way, and of course, he helped make that happen. So um, anyway, thank you, David. George Pryor, uh, go ahead. 
It's just, I, I find it really interesting that in a time that basically everyone will agree, Genesis 12 on is after the pyramids, you know, mm -hmm. you know 2000 BC or later, but things are still pretty different on the world than the way we know them because people are living a whole lot longer. Yeah, to the, true. 147 still pretty. Oh, still pretty old compared to what we see today. <laughs> that's a that's a hefty age. That's right. <laughs> that's that's pretty. What's it? Does anyone remember Joseph's? Was he 120? Did he make it to 120, or was it? He it, got pretty old. Yeah, he got up there too, and um, uh, it it it's in chapter 50, but I can't remember what it is. Sandy, yeah, he was you, 110. There are years. Are there years? Are their years the same as our years? I mean, is that 12 months? Is that a year like ours? Or Yeah, they were counting them by the revolutions of the earth around the sun, although they thought the sun was going around the earth. But yes. <laughs> so yeah. it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be 147 in our year. You're saying it was 12 months or it wasn't? It, it was, it same. Was a month? Yeah. Huh? yeah, same, same. Yeah. Okay. I thought you were saying a year to them was a month. No, yeah. sorry if I said something like that, which I it's do say things months. that I don't even know I say. Yeah. It's 12 months. Yeah, okay. I wonder why ages went down significantly later on, because even after the flood, you know, there were a lot of changes, but still yeah. you have Abraham living to 180, or, yeah. or, or no, Isaac lived to 180, and uh, in Abraham to 175. So okay. I wonder why That's the right. age limit went down even more. Well, and yeah, the, um, you know, the, and there were special people that God seemed to let live longer, like Moses and Joshua, and, and probably Caleb too. Um, you know, they lived a lot longer than the average, you know, because 40 years wandering in the desert you know, killed off everyone 20 years and older. So those people, none of them made it to, well, at the, they, they all, they were going to, it seems from that, that most people were going to die by 60, at least those right. younger ones did. So, yeah. So, I mean, but we know Moses and Joshua lived a lot longer. And so there seemed to be some play, but it wasn't much after that, that, you know, you know, three score and 10, you know, maybe four score, you know, 70 or 80 was kind of the norm you know, after we get, you know, to that point. So I, I mean, I think it would just have to do with, um, you know, language keeps getting worse and worse and worse, you know, even, and we've seen that not in our lifetimes, um, but, you know, Shakespeare's English um, was way more complex than the English today. I mean, language is just disintegrating. You know, we see the effects of the fall just continuing on and on and on. And I think, I think the flood, David, you mentioned that. I think that was one of the huge factors for the life change, you know, but it took a while for all that to take effect, it seems, because you're right. Some people like Noah, well, Noah, of course, lived most of his life before the flood. Um, but, um, you know, things did settle down after the flood as far as the length of years. Uh, but it took a while, like you're saying, it took a while before there weren't cases like this. So it is an interesting thing. It's, it's quite intriguing, you know, actually. It, but. It is. I mean, it's kind of the opposite of evolution. Um, we're actually uh, falling instead of uh, going the other way, which oh. evolution says we evolve. So right, it's right. the total it's exactly, opposite that we see. Yeah, the, the reality <laughs> is totally opposite of what Darwin put forward. Absolutely. <laughs> so we're getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah. So, all righty. Um, Enough depressing, no, I'm kidding. I'm just joking with you. But you're right. I mean, we see it in so many different ways, the disintegration of, um, of human beings. And uh, we feel like we're more advanced and we feel we're better. And, and of course, with technology, we feel like we have oh, all this stuff. And we, you know, and, and advances in science, obviously medical science. Yeah. You know, we've obviously, we're, but as far as our very beings, it's very evident that we are, you know we're sliding downward we're not rising upward so anyway a good point david um so the applications there were two uh, for this week um the provisions god made for the family of jacob cannot be dismissed um he not only saved them from the famine afflicting the land but also provided for them in abundance and, and true 
They were placed in the land of Goshen and given the task of caring for Pharaoh's flocks and herds. We would do well to remember what James 1.17 says. Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Our God remains in control and is able to bless his children abundantly. Um, and uh, we, we see that all the time. And, and we, we gladly accept the blessings of, of God Almighty, even in bad times. Um, and then when Jacob described, application two, when Jacob described his age to Pharaoh, he likened his life to a pilgrimage. Uh, that is an interesting word choice for it indicates his understanding that there is more to life than the physical. Uh, this is the same idea conveyed in Hebrews 11:13, and uh, we've already read this, um, which states, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. I like that it's a confession, not a confession like confessing sins, but a confession as in a declaration, a, a confession, the good confession of Jesus Christ. It's like that. They were willing to proclaim that. They were willing to live that. And so when we confess something, we not only uh, verbalize it, but we live it. And uh, when we confess Christ, we're supposed to live Christ. And, um, and here they, they lived that way. They realized that they were strangers and pilgrims. And that's why they lived by faith, which is what Hebrews 11 uh, is all about. Yeah, go ahead, George. Um, I just go say those blessings, at least initially, the majority of people getting those blessings were either people or descendants of people who sold their brother into Egypt. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> so you got a lot of sinners saved by grace there. <laughs> that is a great point. That is, a, yeah, only Ephraim and Manasseh, only those tribes didn't come from the ones who sold their brother. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge, that's a great point. Um, and just thinking about that, um, uh, I think uh, in Luke 2, um, uh, the, the, the uh, prophetess, Anna, who got to see the Christ before dying, uh, she was from the tribe of Asher. And I was thinking, you know, we don't, we don't really hear much about any of the tribes at all, except uh, Judah. And uh, because Christ came through that one, and they were the, really the ones that stayed faithful the longest, they still went into captivity. But uh, 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 between between the other uh, uh, the other ones in Judah, Judah stayed faithful longer. But uh, yeah, that's that's interesting, George. That's an amazing way to put that because you're right, um, absolutely right. Um, all right, there were three uh, discussion questions. You're welcome to uh, uh, respond to any of them if you'd like. Uh, what we we talked about some of this. What does this passage teach us about the provisions of God for his people? What can we learn from the meeting that occurred between Pharaoh and Jacob? And why do you think Jacob wanted to be buried in the promised land? So, um, uh, and with that, I will make it just a slight comment. I don't uh, see anyone unmuting. On the last one, I think it was just because he knew the promise. You know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had direct, God directly told them the promise about the land, about their descendants, and, uh, you know, Jacob didn't want to be buried in the wrong place. <laughs> so I think it was probably just pretty simple. But people want to be, people, especially as they get older, want uh, the nostalgia. Sets. But with him, I think it was a very godly thing to want uh, to be back. Um, you know, buried with Rachel, um, perhaps as well. So, yeah, just a very, uh, probably pretty logical uh, thing there. Yeah, go ahead, George. So Jacob matures into somebody who's pretty spiritual. Yeah. I wouldn't have wanted to have been his friend in the younger years. So yeah. he's, a, he's a lesson as to what the discipline of God can do for you throughout your life. That, that's a great point because, Jake, you know, we kind of, you know, we kind of look down on Jacob when he's, you know, having Esau sell his birthright for a bowl of soup. And, you know, I mean, just all these different things Jacob did. Um, you know, it, it's, um, but he, you're right. He really does mature and really, um, it, it's interesting. You're going to, um, uh, anyway, as he blesses the sons, um, that's an interesting um, set of, of verses too. I think that's though, I don't know if that's covered in the booklet. I think that's 48 and 49. It might be part in 50, but uh, anyway, uh, interesting reading there. I, I encourage you all to read 48 and 49 before next week, if possible, because next week jumps into 50. Uh, go ahead, Sandy, uh, please. I think human nature that is that way, period. I think people, as they get older, they realize and they see more and, and, and they know more. I just think mm -hmm. it's, I think 
younger people do stupid things all the time. I just think that's human nature, period, though. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think and 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 hopefully it's true. And hopefully people mature and 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 people are kind of forced to mature to, to some extent. And and of course, for all of all of us in Jesus Christ, you know, the maturing is not just a maturing because of age, but we should be maturing, as as George was saying, Jacob did maturing in faith, maturing in spirituality, moving in that uh, right, right direction. And uh, uh, go ahead, George, again, and then Donna, I see that you I are just, um, well. yeah. When I was at Oklahoma Christian taking um, wisdom literature and Proverbs under Dr. Jones, I just remember him saying, he said, you know, wisdom is with the aged, but there's no fool like an old fool also. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great saying. That's really good. That's funny. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, Donna. Well, yeah, when Sandy said that, I was thinking um, kind of like what you said, Clay, about, you know, if we have godly wisdom, then we do mature as we get older. Um, but not everybody has got, you know, there, I mean, I know some old, like, kind of like George said, I know some older folks <laughs> that, that, you know, haven't matured, you know, and they, they're pretty old you know they're pretty up in in years and but you know you you've got to acquire and and strive for that godly wisdom yeah you know and that's how you I think um make better decisions and all when you get older so yeah yeah I think that's yeah right on uh, thank you yeah uh, David Moore go ahead thing I've noticed my maturity in the Lord and I just have so much more um, wisdom now and what the Lord is showing me doors he's opening and than I did when I was younger. I'm just a lot more in tune with what the Lord wants. And yeah, and that's, that, that's great. It, it is. And, you know, I, it's, it's, I, I think it's important that we can recognize those things. Hopefully, you know, we are um, more mature in the Lord now than 10 years ago or five years ago. And, and hopefully we'll be looking to be uh, more mature in, in five years or in 10 years. And, and the, the Christian journey, as uh, Jacob put it, the, the so journey, yeah. um, uh, the journey that this life is, um, is one where uh, there should be growth and, and movement. And so that's, that's great, David, that you're able to uh, recognize that and 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 you you know and giving the glory to who it belongs to and that's God so I think Amen. That's, that's that's fabulous so all right well the next two weeks it'll be um, uh, chapter fifty and like I mentioned at the at the top in case uh, you weren't quite in here uh, some of you but uh, um, uh, uh, David Mays will be teaching uh, the login credentials will be the same uh, several of you in here now do the Tuesday morning class. Uh, Greg wants to practice uh, being the host, so you. But I'll send those out. But the 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 login for, uh, in fact, I already did. Um, uh, to the, the login for Tuesday morning is different, so look at the latest email uh, for that. Um, uh, for this even coming Tuesday morning, he wants to do it once while I'm in town to make sure it all goes okay, and then he'll do it the next uh, couple Tuesdays. But uh, anyway, so just be watching the emails closely for the login stuff, and of course, we start a new quarter. Uh, the following week, um, uh, uh, March 7th begins the new quarter, uh, but several of the classes are starting on March 1st or 2nd as far as the new quarter goes. So just keep your eye on everything. Uh, but for this class, you don't need to change anything. Uh, February 21st, uh, Morning for Jacob, February 28th, Fear and Assurance. It'll be the same link uh, that you clicked on tonight and uh, you'll be able to get in. Um, uh, David Deacon, if you would uh, lead us in a closing prayer, I'd appreciate that. Thanks. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this evening and the blessings you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity to study and to fellowship together. We pray, Lord, that you'll bless us this evening as we, as we finish this class and pray, Lord, you bless us tomorrow in our worship. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.